it, it's interesting, right? There's, uh, there's no longer a draft. So we're dealing with people who joined the military out of a sense of misplaced patriotism, out of, a, out of the, the concrete uh, issues of poverty, of social, of, of personal crisis. Uh, there's always, you know, it's like, uh, I joined as a, I thought, a true believer. Uh, I went into the Marine Corps officer and he asked me what, you know, job I want. And I said, well, whatever job I can be most helpful in. Uh, and uh, so it was, that was those true, you know, but there's also something when people realize that they're lied to, that it's not the what we, we signed up for. That I was looking, I wasn't looking forward to going to kill people, but I assumed I would have to kill people, but I was 100% certain that the people I was gonna kill were 100% bad people. And I was 100% good. <laughs> um, and as I spent years in the, in the Marine Corps, I, I, I realized that wasn't true. Um, and when I was uh, promised I might uh, you know, drop a nuclear artillery rounds on people and build in towns in Iraq, I knew that wasn't true. Um, and right now, uh, the military is dealing with drones and robots and all this stuff. And they're able to deal with volunteers for the most part, relatively small tens of thousands of people on the ground in all these countries. And it, you know, we see the waves of resistance when they start pulling in the reservists and the National Guards and, and putting all those people in Iraq and, and uh, Afghanistan. So right now we're dealing with relatively few people that are taking uh, public stands, realizing that the military's gonna come down on them. Um, and at the moment, we're dealing with people who are anonymously trying to share the information about what's going on with the immigrant concentration camps that they, that we believe, are illegal. That it's not the military's job to do policing within the United States, and that's what they're being ordered to do. And how is tens of thousands of immigrants? And it's wrong, it's immoral. And yet, it's very scary to come up and say that in front of a president, right? Who, who, who of course, will name, will name them personally and ensure command influence, make sure they get uh, years in prison. Uh, Reality Winter, for example, five years in prison for one single document uh, questioning uh, Trump's narrative about the elections. Uh, people, people realize that the stakes are high. And I think there's going to be resistors. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that they know uh, we're going to be there to support them. For example, we're running Facebook uh, campaigns directed at those areas of those bases towards military people, uh, letting them know that uh, there is a basis to support the question, what's going on, the question their orders. Good job. Yeah, just, just one point further on that. I think what Jeff said is important about people who join are doing so for a variety of reasons, often for the benefits, you know, the educational benefits that, that have some employment options. Uh, but they, they really want to believe and they've been taught that what they're doing is the right thing. And when they find out it's not the case, or when they think that the legal foundation or the moral foundation of what we're doing is questionable, uh, they're willing to begin to question. And the question, the challenge is how to do that. We had a uh, a recent Army captain at our conference in Notre Dame a few months ago, uh, uh, an artillery officer in Kuwait, um, and he was basically beginning to question, why are we at war uh, now 16 years after 9-11 mm -hmm. on the basis of supposedly fighting Al-Qaeda when we're fighting or supporting a war in Yemen and we're fighting various groups that have nothing to do with those who attacked the U.S. Uh, 17 years ago. Uh, so uh, that's a courageous act, and he's actually trying to file a lawsuit saying that this continuing so-called war on terror is unconstitutional. Uh, so those kinds of voices are still there, and it's the kind of area, though, where they, they do need that civilian support, and, and we should, uh, I think, be, have the assumption that many people in the military want to do the right thing, there are many recognize that these wars make no sense, that they're questionable legally, morally, uh, and we should support them in that, in that questioning process.
great example really is uh, Lieutenant Potato, who uh, was stationed up in Fort Lewis. Um, and uh, when uh, the build up to Iraq was going on, uh, the second Iraq uh, invasion, um, his command, he was a lieutenant and uh, an infantry lieutenant, and he was gun ho as anybody. And, and his commander said, You know, you're going to be leading men into battle here, and so you should study up on what political situation is so that you'll be better able to inspire your men to charge. And so Lieutenant Matata diligently started studying why we were talking about going and invading Iraq and stuff, and you know, it didn't take him too long to figure out that it really wasn't a good reason. So, I mean, he started off sincere. He was trying to figure out how he could lead his men into battle, and he came up against the cold, hard reality that that wasn't what was going on. And so then he went to his commander and said, hey, you know, I mean, I'm having some problems here. And ultimately, he gave a speech to Veterans for Peace, in which, uh, you know, he got charged with uh, speaking to a veterans group <laughs> uh, you know, against the war. Um, and his trial was interesting because they, they tried him, and, you know, the most distractest guy in the, in the courtroom was Lieutenant Matata. I mean, he, he looked like the most military guy there was. And, and the jury uh, got one over. And, uh, and the, the, they were, you could hear, hear them muttering among themselves a lot of times um, in his favor, and ultimately he was found not guilty. So in this, I want to say that, you know, decent people, when they come up against that spot where they just won't go any further, you know, one of my great faiths in people in general, but specifically the American people, is, is that when they run up against that point where they face the cold reality, as opposed to some hypothetical thing, a lot of times they will do the right thing. At first, it's always uh, individual acts of conscience, I think. You can kind of gauge what time it is in America or in, in any kind of political battle by whether it's individual acts of conscience or when it shifts over to collective and more conscious uh, efforts to, you know, um, usurp military authority or go up against the system <laughs> in whatever form it takes. And it's that moment when, when it collectivizes that, that you really start having power. I think that the, the mutiny article, which suggests that uh, you know, it's one thing if one guy does something, but if two or three guys join together to do it, then it's a whole different category because the power, of course, is in that collectivity. You know, when you get a bunch of people doing something, then, then you know, the brass is really worried because then they really are losing their control. Even 50 so. years later, I don't want you to confess to mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> segue into uh, audience questions because one of the questions actually asked, why wasn't it mutiny? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's why it's not mutiny. I'm like Rich. Rich, the Rich. come up yeah. here and help. <laughs> He's the guy that actually that is not so, so Rich Millard, for those of you who don't know, um, did the pre-trial investigation called an Article 32 hearing into uh, whether the charge of mutiny was um, a warranted charge or not? It wasn't a mutiny because the law as written is this on? No. Yeah. yeah. There are certain elements to crimes. Pardon me? Yes. There are certain elements to crimes. And when you analyze uh, facts and you apply it to the law, uh, if the facts don't fit with the law, then the crime isn't there. In this particular case, in looking at the elements of a mutiny, uh, one of the major elements is that there has to be an intent to override military authority. Just the fact that men were sitting in a protest and appealing to the command to correct the wrongs and the aggravating circumstances that existed in the stockade did not evidence an intent to override the authority. They were appealing to the authority. So the element of overriding military authority wasn't there. It 
Uh, that's one reason. There were several others, but that's the main one. And just common sense. Uh, <laughs> Rich, 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 tell them how they hid your recommendation. Well, <laughs> and, and they ignored it to bring the charges. The Article 32 investigator is supposed to write up uh, findings and recommendations. Keep in mind that in the military, the military uh, justice system it is a command system. Lawyers, uh, investigators, uh, in this case, the Article 32 investigation was more analogous to what in civilian law we'd call a preliminary hearing. And whereas in civilian authority, we have judges who make rulings and orders. In the military, you make findings and recommendations because the officers in charge of the legal proceedings are staff officers who are advising the command. And the command uh, it is the individual or the persons that act upon recommendations. In this case, I found there was no mutiny and made recommendations against going forward with mutiny charges. But what happened is I was in the Presidio JAG office and my immediate commander ordered me to give the recommendations to him to go up through the chain of command. So I gave the recommendations to him, and he put a cover letter over my recommendations, recommending the opposite of what I recommended. <laughs> he gave it to his commanding officer, who put another cover letter over it, uh, recommending they go forward with the mutiny charges. And then it finally got up to the 6th Army area of command, and the 6th Army headquarters were right here at the Presidio, so just a matter of a few hundred yards away, it wasn't like going to some other part of the United States. And they saw, or the General Larson saw, I don't know if he ever read my uh, recommendations, but uh, what he saw were the recommendations of the officers immediately below him. And if he read far enough, he might have gotten to my recommendations. I know as a trial lawyer, um, if I'm writing a brief to a judge, I put the most points, the most important points I can in the first paragraph or two because I worry if I make a motion that's over two or three pages, they'll never read it. And I think that's probably what happened at the Presidio. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and it cost millions of dollars later, great agony for a lot of people. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. said exactly what Rich said uh, three years later. No mutiny, it was disobedience at most. I think on that note, we are going to have to end our discussion for tonight. Uh, we will decamp. People who need to leave can leave. And those who'd like to stay to chat, maybe answer a few more of these questions. I have a whole pile of really great questions in my lap. We can gather in the back of the room around the fireplace. Some of the other people who are participants in this history uh, who weren't on the panel will likely be back there. So we can continue the conversation. But at this point, I would like to thank our panelists. I would like to thank... Thank you. At this time, I'd also just like to show our appreciation to Barbara Sokoloff, the historian at, this, at the museum, that without her, and without her endeavors and hard work over the last year and a half, this event would not be happening, I don't believe. So, Barbara, thank you. Thank you.